welcome to the Cher Roo Show. Hope you're having a great day. Thanks for joining us. Um, the other night I went to this fantastic charity event, and it was, what was it called? Um, a Night for the Dolphins. And it was amazing. Uh, you drove your car to a parking lot on Sunset. You get out of the car, you drive, walk over to the street, and they had these big shuttles. Everybody piles in, and uh, they drove us through all the hills and up to this fantastic house. Um, and the house had three levels, but the guy that owned the house, he's like, you gotta take your shoes off. So there's like 200 people running around this house outside, inside with no shoes. And it was about this uh, documentary about saving the dolphins, uh, the cove, and it was just a really nice charity event. I love going to those. So just thought I'd share that with you. Um, the Oscars. Uh, I don't know how many of you at home watched the Oscars. It was pretty amazing, especially the, um, the show in between with the Cirque du Soleil. Uh, that was really totally different and very fun so I really enjoyed that hope you did too and Billy Crystal he is a fantastic comedian um, he is one of my favorites uh, Robin Williams is my ultimate favorite and of course I love my Judy Tenuta but um, Billy Crystal is amazing also so on that note our first guest is a comedian and I'm going to introduce her to you right now her name is Carolyn Luckett Welcome, Carolyn. It's so great to be here. Oh, thank you for joining us. So, I see you're one of a kind, lights up the room, and is gracious at the same time. What is that? Being gracious? Just trying to be charming and sweet to everybody when I walk in a room and, and acknowledging people. That's great. That's really great. Okay. So, what was your first experience in Hollywood at what age? Well, my very first experience was interviewing Regis Philbin at the age of 12. Wow. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And I also was interviewed by the late Fred Anderson on KBC. Uh -huh. um, I was a, an aspiring broadcast journalist, and I love journalism and writing. I still do. Well, how did, how did Regis Philbin, how did that come about at 12? Well, at 12, you know, basically what happened was I had the interview with Fred Anderson first, and he asked me if there was any other interviews I wanted to do. And I basically said, well, why not read, you know? And he said, okay, we can set that up. And I thought he wasn't, you know, being too <laughs> honest with me, a 12-year-old on the set. But he actually called me up. And the next thing I know, I'm on the set interviewing him. A cute kid interviewing. You know, Very they're always much. a sucker for a cute kid. Um, okay, so you were interested in being a broadcast journalist. Exactly. And so you went to school for that? Um, I didn't. I actually ended up going to just a local community college. I married very young and had my family very young. And, um, you know, it's it's never too late to go back and, you know, kind of revisit things as mm -hmm. an adult. So How many kids do you got? I have two adult children. My son... Oh, you don't look that old. <laughs> That's very sweet. Uh, my son is going to be 22 in wow. April. And he's also a stand-up comedian. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. He's... Do you ever go together and do we stuff? We do. Well, we, we don't actually book together, but we do a lot of the same venues. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's a great guy. So what, what kind of... Um is his act about honestly of all things he actually sings mariachi music wow. and kind of goes with that because he's obviously not latino but the audience loves it so oh, wow for what it's worth i can't sing spanish i try but it's not coming well across. that's kind of fun a lot of fun following you yeah. in your footsteps and then your other child is uh, my daughter melissa is 20 and she's actually going to college in illinois Oh, okay. So, doesn't, yeah. Doesn't want to be a comedian. She wanted to do acting. That was her thing. But now she's actually, you know, pursuing a career in the med medical field. Oh, that's a little more money there. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Okay, so, and your children, when you were raising them, they were diabetic? Yes, they're both actually type 1 diabetics, which is insulin dependent. And was that at an early age? Very early. My daughter was 7 and my son was 10. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, it's always something that's been a part of my life, raising them as a single mom and dealing with that aspect of it. So they had to have the shots every day? Absolutely. Four times a day. Oh, my God. And still do they and have them? still. Four yeah. times a well, day. Well, my daughter's actually using a pump, which is great. It's been oh, a, a okay. big plus. But my son wants no part of it. So that's just him. Personal preference. Oh. 
Well, it sounds like they're they've worked it out and they're going oh, strong. Oh, definitely. So yeah. it doesn't hold you back. Just Not so you at know. all. Not at all. Wow, great. Okay. You like to volunteer for charities. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, I've done a lot of charity work with uh, the Padre Foundation at Chalk at, in Orange County mm-hmm. and also with the Girl Scout Council when my daughter was doing Girl Scouts and I was also an assistant youth minister for five years, which is a whole nother experience dealing with teenagers. Right. Yeah. So when you do uh, the work with the teenagers, how does that make you feel? It's very fulfilling. It's always a learning experience, and I feel like I'm getting more out of it than they are. I know. I, sometimes I, really I think do. when you do these, because uh, I do a lot of charity work myself, and it's it's kind of like I do it. I I do it for them, but I like the high off of it. You know, I enjoy it's addicting. it. It really is, and, it, and you know, it's a great, great group of kids, and they're very, Aww. you know, sweet and just loving, loving kids. It's great. Okay, so what age did you decide that you want to do stand up? Well, that's just been the last few months, actually. Really? It's been very recent since wow. November. Wow, 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 wow. Uh, yeah, so at uh, 44, don't tell anybody. <laughs> Got a few more months until I hit 45. So. Okay, well, how did you get into that? What did you just decide one day you woke up and, or your son was doing it and you thought, I can do it too? Well, you know, my son, actually, I, I've been encouraging him to do it for a while because he's really the one that does the impersonations and has the real ability with it. But, you know, obviously he gets the humor from somewhere. You know, and um, I had one of the comedians come up to me after one of the shows and said, are you one of the comedians? And I said, well, I can be for the right price. (laughs) And she said, you're not a comic. And I go, no, but I am funny. And so I spoke with a friend of mine and he said, hey, you want to do this? And I said, I'll give it a shot. Why not? And I have a lot to talk about being single and 44 and being out there in the dating world again. It's a whole nother experience. I saw your act. It was great. You did. (laughs) So you just kind of like get up there and talk about things that experiences that happen Life to you. Life experience, definitely, right. definitely. And anything about your friends? You talk about well, them too. Well, you know, I I don't mention names, but right. yeah, I definitely draw from some of the people I've talked to and men I've gone out with, and just you know, that's like that could take years. Oh, I, I have a whole list of things. If you I need could some stories, about. call me. I I have lots of stories for you. <laughs> And I think, you know, honestly, the whole experience of dating younger men has been a real challenge, to put it mildly. But it's been real interesting. Well, younger men appreciate an older woman. Yes, they do. They really do. And uh, it's a whole different thing. I think the older men, for some reason, they're stubborn, they're they're set in their ways, and they want to control you. At times, Yeah. yeah. So I don't date older men. I always date younger men. <laughs> and I find the experience very nice. It's been great, yeah. Oh, so but I'm still single. So are you dating now? Is anybody in particular? I just ended a relationship, to be honest. So, yeah, I'm single again as of Saturday. So, you know, Aww. that's the way it goes. Yeah, it's harder. The older you get, the harder it is. You get more picky. Yeah. Well, no. I, I don't know. It's just drama with him. That's all oh, I can we don't, say. We don't like no I drama. I don't want drama. So. No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Well, that's great. And so um, when you get up on the stage, are you nervous? I am a little. Do you get butterflies? A little bit, but in a good way. You Uh know, not anything negative. Has anyone ever heckled you or said get off the stage? The very first time I was up there, I had a friend of mine and she was a little bit tipsy and decided Uh to kind of have fun with me on stage. And, you know, you got to expect that. It's going to happen. But so. that's not a friend, you know. No. It's like, you're not a friend doing that. No, no. I, I mean, I understand, you know. But I guess if you get a bunch of drunk people and they're sitting there going, ah, oh, yeah, 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 we, we don't want to know about your dating, you know. Right. But most people probably most do. Most people are very responsive. Yeah. Yeah, it's I would. Great. I liked it. I want to hear about other everybody else's <laughs> dating experience. I mean, you know. Right, right. It's interesting. Well, gosh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's and been where great. where can people find you, uh, your website, or where they can go see you uh, perform? Well, I do Ontario Improv once a month for Spicy Latino Night with oh. Rick Martinez. Oh, great. And I'm also going to be doing, again, John Lovitz and Pachanga during Easter week. So I have a lot of things coming up. And 
So you do you can, have a website or a place where they can find You can find, find me you? on Facebook like anything else. Carolyn Noel Luckett on Facebook. Spell the, spell your last name? Sure. It's L-U-C-K-E-T-T. Okay, and I think uh, we can put it on uh, below. We'll put it on there so people can join you and add Definitely. you. And that check you great. out on Facebook and go see your show. That would be awesome. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to commercial and we'll be right back. Tonight's episode has been brought to you by Kick and Ketchup, a new all-natural sensation that transforms foods such as French fries, eggs, and meatloaf into a culinary delight. Kick and Ketchup, ketchup with a kick. Curvilicious fashion wear, from casual wear to club wear, dresses and handbags. Curvilicious Fashion Wear is your online trusted source for comfortable, classy, plus-size fashion. Order your next outfit at CurviliciousFashionWear.com. California Country Kitchen, a fun little blog on all things yummy. You can find delicious and simple recipes at CaliforniaCountryKitchen.com. Satisfaction Entertainment. Providing premier mobile entertainment services throughout Southern California for almost 20 years. Stream your next wedding, convention, or corporate function over the internet with our new live streaming services. Visit SatisfactionEntertainment.com for more information. Okay, well we're back and our next guest is Josh Haraway. Welcome, Josh. Hey, how you doing? Thanks how you doing for joining there? us. Okay, so you were born in Palm Beach, Florida. Yes. You went to the School for Performing Arts. Yes, I did. And then you went to study philosophy at Howard University. Yes, I did. And how did that all come about? Well, you're right. I grew up in Palm Beach, Florida, and uh, I was just always inspired by the arts. I liked, you know, you know, the whole thing, visual arts. I was drawn as a kid. Um, I liked theater. I was did interested. you take acting there? Yeah, I studied acting, technical theater. I studied the whole, the whole... So you can do it all. Yeah, I really got into it. So I even studied writing, directing, and I think I was just captivated by the idea that I could have an idea, and then I could express it, and then it could just be Grow. out floating around. Yeah, and just other so people... It's like a baby, so it started from a little baby and grew into an adult. Exactly. A whole project. Yeah, and it oh. kept me up at nights. Really? You know, until it became its own person. And, yeah. Very exciting. Well, at least you didn't have to burp it or, you know. Yeah, no diapers. Yeah, no diapers. Yeah, no diapers. Else, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. And then philosophy. I've always kind of considered myself a philosopher. Um, and I feel I express my, you know, observations and my, my viewpoints and philosophies through my art. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of like a, a natural segue into into studying philosophy and all that good stuff. So. Okay, so it seems like writing, producing, directing, and acting, which is your favorite passion? People ask me that, and um, it, really, it really just depends. It really depends on the idea. I mean, if it's, if it's a song, then, you know, you know, you got to express it through rapping or singing. If it's a, you know, a short story, maybe it's writing it out, um, you know. And then if it's, if it's like a, a film, a project that needs to be filmed, then, you know, that's what it's about. It's, it's usually just about the project. But I will say that um, writing is so solitary that you don't get a lot of feedback until you actually get on stage and, and perform what you wrote or, um, you know, let someone else know about it. So I'd say being on stage is the most instantly gratifying, like acting, um, you know, and watching stuff that you've been in with people and seeing it. It's like, oh, yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, that was funny or, you know, or whatever, right at the moment. Um, but I think the most enduring satisfaction comes from um, writing something that's, that's eloquent or something that I think can actually last, you know, past my lifetime. Because you know, we're only here for so long, and, you know, we leave behind certain things, whatever, but, you know, I feel like writing is, like, a really cool thing to leave mm -hmm. behind. It's like, you know, 700 years from now, someone could read your thoughts and really be in your head, and, oh, this is what, you know, Cheru really felt like, and what it was like to be her, you know, so I really take that seriously, and even though, you know, you're sitting at the computer, you're by yourself, you don't have that instant, you know, oh, wow, that was great, you know, when you put something together that, that you're proud of, it it's a good 
like it's enduring feeling. feeling. Yeah. Oh, that's so. awesome. So you know, yeah. both sides. Okay, so what has been your most proud project? Hmm, my most proud project. Um, I don't know. That's a hard. Uh, that's a hard question. I guess. I guess I'd have to say it's the one I'm working on right now. Um, All right. So tell us. Tell us. We're talking about. It. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, well, the project I'm working on right now is a feature film that I'm in pre-production on. Um, it's called Nat Turner Unchained. Mm -hmm. And it's about a slave revolt from 1831. And it's, it's a crazy story. It's based on a true story that actually happened in, in the 1800s. And uh, I've had the, I had the idea um, when I was in like 15 years old in school and I was reading in my, my history book and I read a line about Nat Turner and that was the only line there. And so I was like, wait, I want to know more about this guy. There was a slave revolt. You know, you know what happened? This sounds crazy. So I just kept over the years you know, accumulating more and more information. And then, you know, I came out here, I started directing and, and working on projects. And I'm like, you know what? I think, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this story. But there's such a barrier to just delving into that world because if you're going to write this situation, it would be Sheru and Josh Haraway sit at a table and speak modern English with their cell phones and it's, it's easy. But for 1831, I'm like, you know, like, what are they wearing? You know, how do they talk? Mm -hmm. So I read a few lines, what you sent me over, because I'm going to try out for that part. Oh, yeah, so definitely. It's interesting. <laughs> I had a, I, you have to be in a river, standing in a river, talking to other, I was talking to other women or something oh, about yeah, the slaves. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. So I, I thought that was part. interesting. <laughs> well, actually, you know, it's funny. That scene that you're talking about is is a part of the revolt where um, a lot of the slave owners are, are actually grouped together, um, you know, in safety in a swamp. Uh -huh. They're trying to be safe from, from the rebels. Because the slaves are chasing them? Yeah, exactly. So those lines that you read for that audition, um, they're actually taken from real people that wow. actually said that stuff. So, like, I, I did a lot of that where I took, like, public domain stuff that people really said back then, and... I kind of, you know, put it in there so that it has this real sense of realism and it's not just like I just made it up. So. No, it sounded real. Yeah, yeah. It'll crazy. be acting for me because, like, I could never have a slave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, yeah. I, I, I hope people today, like, no one, well, the, the weird thing, though, there's actually 27 million slaves now, which is, which is crazy, which kind of blew my mind because everyone always thinks of it as, you know, the back in the day type thing. How could there be slaves now? There are. Um, there's... You know, people, they, they're not, they don't call them slaves, but there's, you know, people that get tricked into, like, coming over here thinking that they're going to be a maid or, you know, parts of Europe thinking they're going to be, like, a, a nanny. And then they get stuck. They get turned into a sex slave. They don't have a passport. And, and it's really weird Oh, where because, they kidnap people. Yeah, yeah people I get see kidnapped. That, yeah. Yeah, forced to, forced to work. And it's weird because people... Sex slaves. I've heard of that. Yeah. So it's very scary. It's sad because you'd think very it's sad. 2012. But yeah. They grab all those kids. Yeah. Little 12-year-olds, oh, okay. you know, prostitutes. You know, they That's don't even horrible. know that they're prostitutes. They're just, you know, trying to live their life and eat and survive. So, What's wrong with those people? Yeah, it's it's crazy. But you know what? It's it's really fascinating at the same time because it's, it's, um, it's, it's just a part of history that, like, sort of repeats, repeats itself. And it's not so much just, you know, like American slavery or slavery now, but just all throughout history, there's been different periods where there's, you know, slaves, masters, the whole class struggle. It just it just fascinates me. And when you break it apart and you look at it in detail without any kind of like, you know, opinion of like, oh, you know, this is offensive or that's offensive or whatever. And you just look at like the raw facts of it. There's there's so many similarities between, you know, one place and another where like, here it's black and white, or was black and white, or whatever. You go to like another place, and it's it's the same exact thing, and the people look exactly alike. Or it, it's just it's just fascinating how people pick something and they say, you know, okay, you're Catholic, I'm Protestant. You look exactly alike, and now we're gonna kill each other because you're Catholic and I'm Protestant, or you're Hutu and I'm, you know. Or you're fat and you're skinny. Yeah, exactly. So. Or you're short and you're tall. Yeah, it's it's. Crazy. I don't get it. I just. I don't look at people what they look like. I just look at their their inner beauty, and I just wish the world was more like that. Yeah. Sad. We're we're here to have love, not hi not hate, <laughs> not fighting. 
Yeah, totally, totally. So it sounds very interesting. It's going to be a great movie. No, thanks. I hope it's, I get bored. Yeah, it's consuming me. You'll definitely <laughs> yeah, kind of have an audition, and like I'm looking forward to seeing yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, me too. Okay. So you have, a, you have an internet uh, series called Funny Horoscopes. What was the inspiration for that? And tell us a little bit about that. Funny horoscopes. Wow, yeah, I, I do have that. I've, I'd forgotten about that. Like, I get a check uh, from that every now and then. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah, Money's that's good. Kinda, yeah, I'm like, oh, what's this? It's like, oh, cool. Yeah, that's great. And then I think about writing some more, and then I'm like, ah. <laughs> move on so is someone. it like fake ho- horoscopes? You're making fun of, like, the horoscopes that yeah, they normally send out? That's what it is, because, you know, I'm I a Leo, the... so it's like, ha-ha, you're a Leo. You're going to go out in the rain today. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I kept reading horoscopes, and they would always say vague, positive things. And I was like, well, you know, specific and sometimes negative things happen to people also. So mm-hmm. why don't I ever read a horoscope that says you're going to get into a car crash and have to go to a chiropractor for six weeks? Like That's or, so sad. You know? Scary. Yeah, so I was like, oh, well, you know but what? But that's not funny. Well, they started turning into funny horoscopes because I would, you know, I would do some good, some bad, some really specific, like, you know, you're going to meet a girl named Chiquita and you know, she's <laughs> going to rub funny. your back and then you're going to break up and her <laughs> ex-boyfriend's going to chase you down. And, I can you hear know. Jose laughing. <laughs> yeah, so stuff like that. Because the more, because the thing is, they're also vague. So the, so you take a risk by being really specific and it's like, wait a minute, you know, my name's not Chiquita. Like, what's your, this is a, <laughs> that but, is funny. So yeah, I started I started writing those, and then um, what happened is um, I was just getting into um, search engine optimization, where you you know you get your your website to climb up on Google or mm-hmm. the other search engines, and so I started tinkering around with it, and um, I found at first it was comical horoscopes, but nobody was searching for that. So then I changed it to funny horoscopes, and I found that you know there were thousands of people searching for funny horoscopes every month. So I got my my um, site to come up for that, and and I woke up one day and I checked my my traffic on my website, and all of a sudden there's like all these people there, and I'm just like, what happened? Like did something break? And I'm looking, I'm like, oh, they're they're coming to read the horoscope. So they I mean, needed a good laugh because the regular horoscope, they didn't believe it. Yeah, it's like you will meet a mysterious fate in a time I get frame. spiritual ones. I you get do? ones that are, yeah, because I'm a Leo, and so it sends me uh, different different things in the spiritual, like, you know, you're going to be doing good, or you're going to be doing this, and it's interesting. Cool. Do you believe, like, that, that there's, like, a, a, a real, like, backbone to that kind of stuff, or do you, do you take it as, like, entertainment? I No, I do believe that you were born on a certain day, a certain time, and um, there's different paths you know, not all of them are really good horoscopes, but there are some really good ones out there. But I would, I take it with a grain of salt, you know. Mm-hmm. But I do believe in it, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think I really believe in it the way the way it is now. But I do think it's interesting that with other animals, like say tadpoles, depending on the temperature of the water that they're in, all of them will either be male or female, just based on like how hot the water is. So if that kind of environmental, you know, mm-hmm. whatever can affect how they're born, then maybe, like, I don't know. I don't know about the horoscopes with Aquarius and Leos and all that stuff. I but, don't know if it counts towards animals. I think it's just people, isn't it? But I'm thinking maybe if that's how it works with animals. It's interesting. Maybe, like, Good. gravity could make us, like, go in one or another direction. I don't know, but. Yeah, it's a whole other thing. Yeah, that's like next show. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to research that. Yeah, I have no idea. So. Okay, so now I know you were on a show from VH1 called Seducing Cindy. Well, actually, it was on um, Fox Reality Channel. Oh, which sorry. Is, Fox it's Reality. no longer with us. So, so, yes, okay, sorry. So, what? What? how how did that come about what kind of an experience was that being on there you met some great friends because i met some of them I yeah knew some of them yeah that's right uh chris noel um jonathan daniel brown who's in the new movie project x he's like mm-hmm. one of the the stars of it um timothy zucker who's on uh, ice road truckers now um so you like, all go to this is this cindy's house or is it a house that they simulate for her um well it was a house i think they rented uh-huh. um it was a really nice house and they forced us to live in captivity 
together. For how long? Um, it was up to two weeks, depending on if, if you didn't get eliminated. Right. Did so. she tan it? She spray tans some of the guests. Oh, yeah. I did see an episode where uh, she, she did spray tan. Uh, I thought that was quite mine. interesting. Yeah. You got to see the guy yeah. kind of naked. And she sprayed. Well, yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't little, see him naked. Well, a little bathing suit on. And she <laughs> yeah. sprayed him, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, he came back, and I'm like, dude, are you in blackface? Like, what? why are you so dark? Like, but she likes dark, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it was it was an interesting experience. It was um, the first uh, reality show I had done where like they actually put you in a in a house, and you can't talk on the phone with anyone outside. You can't read the newspaper. You can't watch you know, TV or news or even listen to the radio. So what'd you guys do at night? We just got filmed bothering each other and, and getting into arguments. And I mean, they keep the fridge stocked with beer. So they want you to fight. Well, yeah, I think that's the formula. I mean, despite the content that gets produced by these shows, the actual, you know, process of making a reality show, it's, it's really deep because what it is, is it, it deprives, the people of their reality and and you figure out oh reality is communication with other people whether it's watching cnn and hearing something on there or talking to your friend on the phone you're getting information that sort of shapes your view of the world and and when you take a group of people and you cut them off from any sources of information other than just stuff that happens in the house what happens is someone drops a ketchup packet and then that becomes the CNN moment. It's like, oh my God, did you hear he dropped the ketchup packet? Whereas in real life, you'd be like, oh, you know, Syria, you know, is, is in revolt and there's crazy stuff going right. on. It's like, the ketchup packet, F you, man, you know, and everybody's drinking. <laughs> they keep the fridge, you know, full of liquor. So, you know, you have a bunch of dudes, they're not going to work. You know, you don't have a wallet on you because you're not spending money. You don't have car keys because you're not driving anywhere. So it's, it doesn't seem like it, but it really, it really, puts you in a in a different place mm-hmm. despite the fact that like the end result is people in hot tubs mm-hmm. making out and stuff it's like it's it's not like a deep end result but like and then when you leave i mean it was it was really weird um you know and everybody said the same thing like you leave and it's like all of a sudden you're hearing the radio while you're in the van driving to your car and you're just like wow there's music and then you see girls, you know, and you're like, oh, there's, there's girls, other, other people, <laughs> other than that one girl that was in the house. Wow, this is great. And you get the newspaper, and you're just like, you're spending money again, you're driving, you're like, wow, this is crazy. But it really showed me that, like, everything is like that. And even though the realities that we get used to in our regular life are like a broader reality where we can kind of drive to Vegas or whatever, it's still sort of like a little maze where we repeat the same routines over and over again and we kind of get stuck in this rut where oh i'm gonna call sheru or oh, i'm gonna drive down this street and you feel like oh i'm totally free but but it's more like you know it's kind of like you're in you're in your little thing and it's your reality whereas if someone pulls you out and they kill all your connections to those people and like drop you in like a prison or you know over here and now all your connections are new you're in a completely different reality and, and that's what reality is it's all the people contained you're connected reality to. Yeah. So was any of the guys really into Cindy? Um, I, I, th- Chris. I think that um, <laughs> that's a good question. You know what? You would have to ask them. My opinion is that, um, you know, Cindy, Cindy's a great, great woman. I know her. She's very sweet. She's, she's cool. She's definitely worthy to have people after her. Um, but it, it's, it's just weird because we only saw her. For like, you know, an hour a day. Oh, you know wow. what I mean? Or like, you know, two hours or something. So most of the time you're in the house with all these knuckleheads, you know, and mm-hmm. everybody's drunk. I don't drink myself. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like they couldn't, the producers weren't really going to get like me like running around acting stupid or whatever. But everybody else was. And it's just kind of like. Very entertaining. Yeah, that's that's entertainment. So I, it, was, it didn't seem to me like it was so much really about Cindy. I mean, like one of our tasks was to go masturbate to one of her uh, Playboy magazines into vials and then turn those vials in so that our sperm counts could be measured. And they had some extra... Okay, that's stupid. Yeah, it's, it, that, that's what they that came up stupid. with. That is stupid. And one of the extras or, or whoever they got, an actor or whatever, is wearing like a lab coat and acting like he's like measuring the sperm count. And it's like, look, you know, I don't think that's a real doctor and I don't think he could really measure I all the sperm I don't think anybody counts. cares about that. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't think so either. But that's the kind of deal that I missed that out. episode. Thank God. That was that was episode number two. I missed so, it. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a cute show, and you yeah. guys were all great. Yeah, it was it was funny. I mean, I I gotten recognized off of it. So you enjoyed it. It yeah, it was definitely um, a valuable life experience. I'll say it like that. There's a little fly in here. Go away. Um. Okay. So. You're a Tupac impersonator. I'm the world's first Tupac Shakur impersonator. Um, you know what? I think we have a little video of that. So why don't we watch that and then we'll come right back. Okay. Sounds okay. good. For years, people have told me that I look like the late rap star Tupac Shakur. So last year, I put on a bandana, glued a nose ring to my nose, gathered together a couple Mercedes Benzes, a hot porn star and shot a lip sync music video to one of Tupac's popular tunes. And that's how I became the world's first Tupac impersonator. My name is Josh Haraway. And this is Tupac Alive. Okay, so tell us a little bit about how this came about for you, Tupac. Um, well, about six years ago, um, I was directing music videos. And uh, everywhere I went, um, no matter what club or restaurant, like girls would come up to me, you know, bouncers, and they would say, you look like Tupac. And this would happen repeatedly, maybe you know, two, three times a day. And you know, I'm not Tupac, obviously. And I, I had been a fan of Tupac's, but I'm, I'm very, you know, unique. I'm, I'm my own person. I was like, you know, whatever. I'm me. But people kept saying it so much. I was like, you know what? I'm doing music videos anyway. Why don't I dress up like Tupac? See how much I really look like him. Study his movements. Make a lip sync music video. Use my search engine optimization skills to turn it viral. And use that to draw attention to my directing work. Well, what happened is I was shooting the video. You know, I have all the tattoos on. I got the bandana on. I spent three weeks studying his movements and his biography and such. I go on break to get yogurt, which is not gangster at all. It's, you know, pretty... Oh, two pucks getting some yogurt. What flavor does he like? <laughs> I'm getting like a strawberry banana. <laughs> And, you know, I'm dressed like Tupac, so all the bag boys at the Ralph's uh, grocery store literally stop bagging the people's groceries. Wow. And they all just come over and surround me. And I'm just like, hey, you know, I'm just trying to get some yogurt. And they're like, man, you look just like Pac, you know. What are, are you doing a movie or what are you doing? And I was like, hmm, perhaps I could create a new revenue stream with this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so from that point on, instead of it just being uh, something to draw attention to my directing work, it turned into like people actually wanting me to just do Tupac, mm -hmm. and they're like, you know, calling me up and and you know offering me like different roles. I mean, that's how I got the Seducing Cindy reality show, and you know, bachelorette parties, you know, um, birthday parties. Oh yeah, hi, I'm having a bachelorette party. I want Tupac. Yeah, that, I mean that's that, cool. that happens, and, and and the cool thing about it is, um, I was the first to actually do it. Start doing that. So can you sing? Yeah, I well, I don't really sing, but I can I can rap like Tupac. I'm not in character right now, but uh, but and I can also lip sync, you know. So so whatever they want, you know. Sometimes people want like a meet and greet where you know Tupac takes pictures with them. People love taking pictures with Tupac. Other times they want um, you know me to do the performance. Well, you know, I did a performance. I know at, uh, you did. Yeah, you did yeah. a performance for me. So so yeah. What do you? What they do you loved think? it. Are you yeah. kidding? That was a spring fling. Yeah, that was so much fun. So. So yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, it it's a it's a cool thing because I mean, if I had to look somebody like somebody, I mean, you know, I could look like Adolf Hitler, no. O.J. Simpson, or Tupac. I picked Tupac. I mean, so it's like you know, it's like it's I not. I want to be Shirley bad. Temple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad deal, and uh, you know, it's, it's it's fun. So he's a, he's a, and I think he was a great poet too. So okay, so who out of everybody that you know you look up to, who who would be your inspiration? My inspiration. Um, 
I'd have to say um, my inspiration usually comes like outside of the entertainment industry. Like I really admire a lot of the the old um, like Western philosophers. Even I mean I mean some some of like the the Eastern guys too. Like uh, like Rene Descartes is like one of my favorites. Voltaire mm-hmm. is is one of my favorite guys. Um, I like him because when you read his work now. Um, it's it's just good. It's fun. It's it's fresh, exciting, you know. But back when it came out, um, he was sort of ridiculed, and he was accused of writing like pornographic stuff and mm-hmm. and being too out there. And he got banned from France. But then when he died and came back, they had parades, you know. So it's 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 interesting how um you know a lot of those guys who wrote back in the day, um, they would just really come from their heart and really write what they needed to and they you know they would get put in jail for it you know the guy went to jail for his writing and it's 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 crazy but i i I really um yeah where's that freedom of speech yeah well they didn't have that back then yeah especially in france so it's like yeah but yeah i i I dig that i think that's cool and then you know descartes i think socrates i i just like the guys that um sort of like came up with their own ideas for things or or thought outside the box yeah, kind of like me. And that's those are my role models. So that's great. I'm, I I I'm trying to. I mean, I don't know if I'm Socrates yet, but <laughs> <laughs> so give it a few more centuries. Okay, so how do you feel about the messages that hip hop uh, artists tell in their songs? Um, well, that's, that's a pretty broad question. I mean, do you do you mean like anyone in particular, or no, just in general? I mean, do you do you like? There's a lot of a lot of them are just okay, but a lot of them are violent, and a lot of them tell stories. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, I my viewpoint on that whole thing um, is that when you're talking about hip hop, like as a as a genre, or to include like rap and just everything where somebody's rapping, there's a beat, and um, it it's such a huge um, genre that you kind of have to break it into into sections and if you talk about like the top 40 songs you talk about like the hit songs that that you know like little wayne and 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 um a lot of guys that are really really popular um a lot of that is is the corporations because you know none of those guys have control of you know the radio stations none of those guys have or most of them don't have like distribution companies so when you look at it as a, as an actual business and not just in terms of the artist who's speaking at the moment, you you have to kind of go up the ladder and see who's who's in charge of the companies. And those are the people that um, actually can say yes or no to what's going to be on the radio and what isn't going to be on the radio. Whereas, you know, the rapper, he's there's a million rappers and they just want to get paid some money and kind of get out there. So you don't think that they have a serious message they really want to get across? Um, I think I think that um, there's so many different rappers. It's hard to group them all together. But I think there are some rappers that that are are strictly into you know you know you know making you know I'm making money and you know I got 15 bitches and and all this kind of stuff. And then you have other rappers that aren't uh, talking about that kind of stuff. But again, if you look at it like if you look at the whole picture and you look at the incentives that are there. You find that the 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 companies that are actually in tr- control of all this stuff, they're the ones who are n- more encouraging that kind of stuff because that's what they can sell easiest, and that's what they can sell to their their audiences, you know, the fastest. Mm-hmm. So of course you're going to have a bunch of guys trying to provide that. But on the other hand, if you look at like a lot of like underground hip hop, there's there's a lot of people out there that don't ever get played on the radio. Um, that actually have crazy positive messages about you know building up like the communities and and I and like helping that. People. I think those are the ones that are good. Yeah, and you know I I think it's it's interesting that a lot of times we look at things in terms of like you know this is what's being pushed at us, but at the same time we're responsible in terms of like what do we listen to, what do we give those ratings points to, like what artists are we buying you know the music from, and so. I, I mean, I don't, a lot of the stuff on the radio today, I, I listen to some of it just so I can stay current on like what's going on. And, and I'm just like, 
man, this is just garbage. I mean, back in the in the nineties, um, you know, it seemed like what was popular in terms of hip hop and what was actually selling, at least there was some kind of like a like a, a um a lyrical aspiration where like what I'm saying has to have some kind of cleverness or, or some kind of lyrical structure. Like I I tried. Now a lot of the stuff that's like really popular, and this is just my opinion, it, it doesn't have like um it doesn't seem like, you know, it has a lot of thought process process in it. It's more of like a beat mm-hmm. and just throwing some words together. But again, it's you know, it's what are people buying? What are those companies, those few companies controlling everything? What are they trying to sell? And it's it's just uh that's why I think it's cool that, you know, now we have the internet. Now people can just kinda make their own music. And if you really like an artist, you can go to their website, you can, you know, watch their YouTube video, you can, you know, pay and them. Support money. them. Yeah, mm-hmm. and support them. That's so good. yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. We uh, really appreciate it. Where can people find you on the website? Do you have your own website? Um, I have my own website. Um, it's uh, haraway.com, H-A-R-R-A-W-A-Y.com. But um, if you would like to check out the project I'm working on right now, it's called Nat Turner Unchained, and you can find it at natturnermovie.com. It's N-A-T and then another T, U R N E R. M O V I E dot com. Or if you're having a bachelorette party oh. and you want Tupac to come and shake his thing. <laughs> Tupac impersonator dot com. <laughs> T U P A C impersonator dot com. So. Okay, so I want to thank Carolyn and Josh for joining us. And I think uh, we're going to show a little clip of Seducing Cindy on the way out. And as always, <laughs> thanks and see you next time. Josh. I must admit, when you first got out of the car, I did think Tupac was alive again. (laughs) Will you please stay? Yes, I will. Okay.